In the previous video, we looked at these three equations from the SIR model and some heuristic arguments about where they came from. In this second video, we're going to be looking at how to prepare these equations for numerical solution, that is, how to solve them with a computer. This notation might look kind of imposing. It's a lot to process all at once, so let's pare it down to just one equation. Let's remember what this equation is describing. It's describing a relationship between two quantities, S and I. S stands for the susceptible population, and I stands for the infected population. If you're used to solving algebraic equations, this might be a little bit misleading, this notation. When we look at an algebraic equation, we might be saying something like 7 equals x plus 5, and we're looking for a single number x that satisfies that relationship. What can I add 5 to that'll give me 7? Oh, it must be 2. This is not what we're looking at. These equations are not just describing a relationship between numbers, but this equation is describing a relationship between functions. S is a function of time, and I is a function of time. This equation says that the rate of change of this function, s, is proportional to the product of the two functions, s and i, at every point in time. Clearly, this isn't quite enough information to figure out what s and i are, in general, because we don't know anything about i. So we need our second equation, which describes the rate of change of i. This says that the rate of change, or the slope of this function, i, is equal to the opposite of the slope of the function s, we see that these are opposite slopes, minus a bit, a bit that's proportional to the function i itself. That's a more complicated relationship. Finally, we have our third and simplest equation, which describes the rate of change of the quantity r, which represents the recovered population as a function of time. And if you're familiar with calculus a little bit, then you know if the rate of change of r is equal to gamma i, then r itself must be something like the integral of i. So that's a simpler relationship for us to figure out. Next, we want to look at some special points and meaning in the solution to these equations before we figure out how to formulate the solutions. As we know, one of the most important parts on this green curve is the point where it's maximum, where its slope is zero. This is the time when the largest number of, number of individuals are infected and need medical services. Well, how do we know when that curve is maximum? It's when this slope, di dt, is equal to zero. I have zero slope here. When is that? It's when the first term is equal in magnitude to the second term, so that when I take their difference, I get zero. It says when the rate at which people are recovering is equal to the rate at which people are becoming infected, that's the time when this green curve is going to be at its maximum. So notice that that's slightly after the point, in this instance, where the blue curve is equal to the red curve. It's where the blue curve's slope is equal to negative the red curve's slope. Now how can we go about solving these equations? Well, there are several ways to solve them. We're going to use a numerical method today. We're going to split up this derivative so that the numerator remains on the left-hand side, but the denominator is moved over to the right-hand side of the equation. What does this say? It says that for a small change in time, we can predict what the small change in the susceptible population is. So as long as these changes are small, we can approximate this relationship by advancing a little bit in time, and then advancing the amount of change in the susceptible population. We can apply the same procedure to the other two equations. Now let's suppose for simplicity that this change in time dt is one day, and that we can split this change in the function s into a difference between the quantity s on day i plus 1 and the quantity s on day i. So making that split, it looks like s on day i plus 1 minus s on day i is equal to this change on the right-hand side. And when are we measuring these quantities? Well, we need to make a choice. Let's say that these are the quantities on day i. So now I have a prediction for the change in s based on the values of s and the values of capital I on day lowercase i. What we'd really like to have is the i's on one side and the i plus 1's on the other side, so let's move this term here over to the right-hand side. And now we have what we're looking for, a prediction for the size of the susceptible population on day i plus 1 
in terms of the quantities that we already know on day i, because day i has already arrived. So we can predict the future based on our current values, and then we can use those predicted future values to get yet still further in the future values. This method of using the current day's information to extrapolate uh, a value for the future based on the slope that we're estimating linearly is called the forward Euler method, named for this guy, Leonhard Euler. You know what this hat always reminds me of? A compound your chicken! Anyway, Euler was pretty clever, but this is the most basic method for advancing equations like this, the forward Euler method. Unfortunately, it's numerically unstable, and it doesn't give accurate results for large values of time step. However, all of the better methods, well, most of the better methods are based on this method, and this method makes intuitive sense. So it's what we're going to use for this presentation. We can apply the same procedure to the other two equations, and now we have what we're looking for, values for s, i, and r, say on day 21, if we already know the values on day 20. In the next video, we're going to actually apply this method using some commonly available numerical tools.